Hi, I'm Chris. I'm a doctor. I'd like to summarise a great book called Process Redesign for Healthcare Using Lean Thinking. A guide for improving patient flow and the quality and safety of care by David I. Ben Tovin. Lean thinking you may well be familiar with. This originates from the Toyota manufacturing plant and steps to improve efficiency and streamline this process were introduced with great effect. Now, healthcare and manufacturing are different. The main reason is because unlike manufacturing, in which a raw material may move through and then the end result could get purchased by a customer, in healthcare, the customer is the raw material. And by that, they're a participant on this journey. And even their authorization and permission can't be taken for granted. This involves getting good consent from somebody. But healthcare isn't that different from the service sector. So often people would want a pleasant environment, prompt service, clear information, respectful treatment, choice, a product that works and value for money. But the thing that healthcare differs is that people want a plan. So the patients want to know what a plan is. And often, however, it's them who are the only person who seems to actually know the plan because the healthcare team is many different people coming together to see them. And if that person happens to be very sick, delirious or unconscious, they may not be able to communicate that plan. At that point, they really need a family member or a good friend to be an advocate and really to try and help the process run as smoothly as it can do. How do you know what people want from healthcare? Well, the novel answer is to actually ask them. And now that's become quite wide stream and mainstream thinking in healthcare. Even to get published in some journals, you need to have had some patient participation input. If we want to look at the workload in a hospital, what we'd find is that about 80% of it is straightforward. 10% can take a small amount extra and 10% is extremely complicated and often would take half a day plus to solve on its own. So what do we do? Well, we could look at requests as units of time and build them into short or long tasks. And then we could try and put these into different streams and try and work out what specifics need to be taken into account to complete that task. And it's worth thinking about the journey through healthcare and actually critically analyze it to see what can become more efficient. Because although it's overall a complicated process, it's actually harder for different groups who are involved in care to see the process as a whole. And participants often can't see how their individual steps link up with processes further down the line. And what can impact is poor coordination at the delivery of care, and then it's really hard to get the process going smoothly. And if you're analysing things like this, you don't just have to do this on patients. You can do it on staff, whether it be in doctors, nurses, allied healthcare professionals, or even delivering equipment such as towels. There's an interesting bit about waiting and queuing. And there's actually a distinction because waiting implies waiting without order, unlike queuing, which implies there's an order. Overproduction in healthcare can be considered in particular if healthcare providers get paid for a procedure they do. So for example, if somebody has knee pain and the doctor was paid to do arthroscopies, they may encourage them to have an invasive procedure that isn't necessary. In many hospitals, what you'll have are people called outliers or boarders. These are patients who are looked after by one team of physicians 
whom are actually scattered out the hospital, they're not in their parent ward. And this is often around 20 to 30% of patients are cared for as, as boarders. And this is a resultant waste in motion of people going to one place and then having to come back. Some hospitals may want a pull mechanism, and that's in which actual wards or teams of specialists with a particular skill set and interest go through the hospital, such as to the emergency department, and take the patients that they would most benefit and bring them to their ward so they can help them the most. That's a potentially efficient way of doing things. Be aware of your sphere of influence. And often if you're trying to make change, you need to involve other key players who have a sphere of influence over some that you need to involve. Also, when you're trying to make change, often you'll find that there is one issue and people, rather than sticking with that issue, they will then say, yes, but how about a different issue? So it may be that medications that are dispensed late in the day, then they will say, well, why wasn't the script done sooner? And what this is, is called scope creep. And really be sure when you've got a project that you have a clear scope of the project and the key people who have the appropriate sphere of influence so that you've got a good chance of success here. Process redesign for healthcare assumes that competent practitioners will be well versed in the advances in their field. And the intent of process redesign is not to challenge their competency, but it's actually to provide them with a method for these practitioners to, will, to be enabled to practice their skills in a more efficient and effective way possible. Scoping defines where to look and the big picture map creates a simplified model of the healthcare process involved. Process mapping and big picture mapping, you may wonder what they are. They're not simply about an engineer or a redesigner trying to understand a process. It's actually a collective activity in which a map is created by both direct and indirect interaction with the public, if needed, or participants, often healthcare staff. And to be successful, you need the key players, the right people in the room. There's no point in having it with purely senior clinicians or equally without the clerical or administrative staff who are greeting people because often somebody thinks they know what goes on in another bit, but they're not sure. And even if that's what it's meant to be, it may be, yeah, well, that's what we did before, but we do something now. So together, you really need to get with each other, sit down and define the current mapping system. Root cause analysis. How do you do this? A simple way is ask why, five times. So when they've answered the first why, ask why the next thing happened. And if you can do that five times, often you'll find the root cause. Process mapping is something in which you can either ask people to track the time they spend on particular tasks or perhaps follow them about. What you'll find if you get into quality improvement is that key performance indicators are often mentioned. Now be aware about these because they're in theory important, but what you may find is that you soon have numerous key performance indicators to pay attention to. Often it's best to select at the things that you're an outlier on, an outlier in the wrong way. And that's often looked at as being out with the 25% confidence interval. But be aware when looking at lots of KPIs that there's still a 1 in 20 chance that a 95% confidence interval is out. When we think about wastage and quality improvement, we're looking at time that's spent that could be 
better spent doing something else, in particular time spent looking for someone or something. And if you can cut down wastage, that's a good thing, and then you can allocate better tasks that would help fulfill that time more wisely. Of course, this book mentions that plan, do, study, act, cycle. And when it comes to planning care, we often would refer to scheduled or unscheduled care. Scheduled generally means within 24, more than 24 hours in which it's planned. Whereas unscheduled care would mean that it is unanticipated and often it occurs less than 24 hours from the incident, for example. And you can also look at work and divide it into short and long time scales. But time isn't the only factor to consider. The skill for both long and short work involved is important. And generally, if you want to get the work done the best, you want it done by somebody who's most experienced at that particular line of work. Flow. Well, once a process has been defined, there's a series of steps which are then clear. What then happens is often a work group would get together and turn its attention to the flow through this process. And flow is really in the central heart of lean thinking and in process redesign work. So first, whatever is being worked on has to be left with the next step so somebody else can work on this further. And if you do that and there is one thing that is generating more output than the other, it's hopelessly inefficient. So the what's being worked on trying to select this through for process into the next is something that's often looked at first. Secondly, it's the pace of production and knowing about the downstream capacity because otherwise there will just be delays. And uneven flow can often actually lead to unused capacity as machines, for example, that could perhaps scan 10 people an hour are only being used one or two times. So in process redesign, it's often looking at a principle that involves predictable patterns of demand rather than preferences to suit the staff or the institution. And this strategy often tries to reduce things um, and influence many things in particular batching. Now, batching is when you do a lot of particular tasks at one point. Human beings as a whole, we all have a tendency to see the world from our own point of view and to value the time and convenience ahead of ourselves rather than others. And healthcare with its own particular imbalance of knowledge actually is prone to this. So what in the past happened was that really healthcare providers valued their time more than the patients and therefore would put the convenience to them. Whereas this isn't great and you can look at some innovative methods to try and reduce unnecessary queuing and one of them would be perhaps splitting an on-call take or perhaps redesigning a fracture clinic so the workload is more consistent and that would perhaps be a successful example of process redesign. What often occurs is an error happens, unfortunately, and then what somebody does with well intention is puts a step in, a check step, to try and prevent the error. However, what you may find is that more and more check steps are added on which have errors in themselves. And at times, when you, it's often easier to add an additional check step rather than looking back and saying, is that really needed? Because what was needed as a check at one point to prevent an error, in future, that may no longer be important 
as that error won't be happening from process redesign. So you need to be careful not to just keep adding check steps which all potentially have their own error rate and instead be mindful about the current process. You may hear about 5S. These are translations of a set of Japanese words. Siri, Siton, Siso, Siketso and Shitsuki. And they're actually translated as sort, shine, set in order, standardize and sustain. And this is often when you're thinking about trying to improve, say, a cupboard you could imagine it by. You'd take everything out and you'd sort it and you'd throw away some things and put the things you want to definitely keep and the things you want to review. Then shine. Take the opportunity to improve things and clean them up. Set in order in which you then develop a structure for access and storage based on use patterns. Standardize. Formalize this structure so that the storage and retrieval solutions become standard practice. And sustain is about ownership. Who is taking responsibility to maintain that area? So if you think of in hospitals, lots of people put cannulas in. And if you have this in one ward and in a different ward, they're all in a different place. This is often leading to time wastage. Whereas if these can be standardized, somebody knows what it is, this can be efficient. Visual management is a term currently used to describe a range of strategies that use visual systems to support process management and process control. The basic principles behind many of the visual management strategies actually go back to insights from an important figure in perceptual psychology called J.J. Gibson in 1979. Gibson talked about environmental affordances, which he defined as all actions latent in the environment, but more easily understood as those features of the environment that instruct you. So if you think of a door with a pull handle or a push slab, that's a good example of affordance. This was further developed by a designer called Donald Norman in 2013. And some of these in which affordance, good affordance, will just show you how to instinctively hold an object, for example. And in healthcare, we've generally not been good from the point of view of affordance. We're not great at having clear signs that provide useful information with symbols and commands, or even floor markings to make it easy to see who has arrived first. The ideal visual management is that anybody from a senior consultant to a junior clerical officer could look at this and immediately understand and act on it appropriately. And I believe given the opportunity, healthcare workers could really improve things here if they collectively get their minds together and boundless improvements could be made in terms of affordance. I'll come back to cues for a bit. And there's the cue in theory and operational research and these concern how different kinds of cues develop. And there's actually a discipline behind this and not all cues are equal. Healthcare, what we often have is a short-term and a long-term cue. A short-term cue may be somebody waiting for an X-ray or waiting at the emergency department. And long-term cues would often be somebody waiting typically at home for an outpatient procedure to occur. And what you'll often find these cues referred to, the long-term cues, are waiting lists. And how do we manage these? Well, it's difficult because what often will happen is you've got urgent and routine. And then somebody will come along and say, look, we've got a routine that are waiting so long. They're not urgent, they're semi-urgent. So then there'll be an additional slot put in for urgent semi-urgent routine lists and this may further go on. They're well intended 
but what tends to happen is the average wait time increases because if you're in the routine queue and there's now three queues ahead of you instead of one each time somebody bypasses you you're will you will be queuing a lot longer if we think about how an actual clinic is designed what you'll often find is that there's short-term queues with people waiting to see the healthcare practitioner and there may be a buffer slot added which is often tried to be kept free so that if and when an necessary emergency arises then the clinic isn't falling too far behind and that's really just to contain the disruption caused by having to fit an emergency patient in. And as a rule of thumb, if intrusions represent more than 10% of the workload of clinic, then it's actually possibly better to try and separate these streams into planned and unplanned. And if it's not possible, which is often the case in general practice, a common strategy is to have the planned appointments at the start and the unplanned ones bundled up together that are then seen on a first in first out basis. And this book mentions an interesting alternative strategy for time in clinic appointments. Let me explain it. You'd see the smallest, quickest review appointment ever. Let's say that's five minutes. And then your clinic, which may be say five hours, is then divided up into five minute slots. And then the clinicians are asked to then say how much time is required. Perhaps a new patient may take four of the five minute slots. A particularly complicated person may take six, but then others may just only take one. And then after seeing that person, if follow-up is required, they'd be instructed to see the administrator who would then arrange for a further appointment with the correct amount of time. Now, that sounds good, but what often happens is you get a fully booked clinic and it may in sometimes even be cancelled with ill health from a doctor or a domestic crisis or some unplanned emergency. Then you'll have the difficulty that you've got a whole clinic that needs to be slotted in as extras when often the clinic's fully booked for the next six months. So how do you get over this? Well, one way of trying to improve this is rather than saying, I will see you in a year and at that point, here is your appointment time. Instead, I'll see you in a year and a month or two before, you will be contacted to give the exact appointment time. Obviously, you need to keep the address and contact details, whether it be the email or mobile, up to date to do this. And it does take an additional administrative burden in which you're contacting people to get the appointments. However, what you're doing is reducing the do not attend rates. And also, you're avoiding the headache of having to reschedule a potentially very busy clinic if it is cancelled. So process redesigners like to try and keep things simple. They can count to two, perhaps three. Life or death, everything else, or perhaps life, death, very soon, everything else. If it's more than three, then you may want to rely on a combination of common sense and Little's law. See, common sense tells us that our predictive capacity about unfolding illness is limited. So I may not be able to know if in a year it's the best follow-up. Something else may have come up in between. And Little's Law states that in the long term, the average number of customers in a stable system is equal to the long-term average effective arrival rate multiplied by the average time a customer spends in the system. So despite the apparent unpredictability, emergency department short-term queues can be considered to be quite stable because the underlying characteristics of times and numbers of patients that arrive vary little from 
week to week or day to day and it does depend which day you're comparing and long-term queues are waiting lists by their very nature are stable systems as they've got planned exit points and defined internal structures so the general point is that prioritization in any service enables a small page, uh, number to be seen relatively quickly but one person's priority is another person's additional weight and it's not right Erling's variable is the average number of jobs arising per hour and using per hour as the common denominator if you want you could use minutes or per day and the service rate is a different factor in which that's the average number of jobs the existing resources will be able to deal with so it's actually possible to look at the service rate and the average number of jobs arising and find out what's called the utilization rate by dividing average arise, arriving by what the service um, potential is and if this is well below 85 that's great news from the quality improvement perspective as it means that there's going to be a fair bit of waste queues can potentially be reduced and eliminated and things could be transformed to make there be less likelihood of queues so let's take an example of the CT scanner if it's not being used to its full capacity you could investigate why it may be that people are having time wastage looking for a radiologist who is going to be in introducing IV contrast and perhaps having a rotor may make that better because equally the radiologists if they're not on call for this are likely doing something else so then interrupting their tasks it could be that the radiographers are all having a break at the same time so there's nobody to man the machine if it's under 85 percent as i say you can make changes and look for some improvements if however the rate is 85 or above it's much harder to get any of these quick wins and to become more efficient instead you're really looking at which improvements can perhaps save a few minutes and which can some steps be eliminated merged or simplified it's challenging work and you'd really need some ingenuity and flexibility of all staff involved to try and get any improvements if the rate's over 85 percent already if you're working at full capacity all buffers are removed so each patient is unique not so easily predictable if you're working at full capacity almost inevitably queues will be certain so keeping things simple and separating the value streams and challenge prioritization whenever you can immediate threats to life and limb and other very urgent problems have to be prioritized but leave it at that and see the rest of the patients in order of arrival acknowledging the extraordinary skill and ingenuity of the shop floor staff display as they keep the work going and don't ever take them for granted and really what you don't if you can't get something that will definitely work try the first in first out FIFO because it's easy to explain and relatively easy to manage and the book suggests that FIFO does save lives and people who don't like it they'll make their views known anyway but be aware that just because of a few who are very outspoken that doesn't mean you need to derail changes if you're asking staff or patients about things think about are things different from how they used to be is the work easier or harder to do are patients getting a better service should we go with the new way of working and although they're simple questions the very important thing is then to clearly listen to what the people respond with for process redesign widely publicized 
what you're actually trying to do so that all the relevant stakeholders know the aim. Remember, short is short because the limited number of process steps. Short work is not simple work. And an emergency department work um, actually reinforced the concepts of using short and long rather than simple and complex. And in an emergency department in the book, it mentioned that they were divided by probably going to stay, probably going to go home and recess. And basically you had one team working on both of these in a first in first out mechanism and then recess would take priority and draw staff if and when required. I did like this uh, digital solution the book mentioned. This tries to overcome bleep tag in which you bleep somebody, they're busy so they don't get back to you. So then you try and phone them, they're still busy, they then phone you back but you're not there because you're busy. So instead they created a web app called EMTB and really this allowed people to log work that is required such as a cannula, ward 15, bed 23 and it would automatically populate a time that would then be assigned to somebody's workload and they would prioritize accordingly. The other benefits are that if you have a kind of hospital manager who's trying to oversee work uh, then potentially they'll see who's fallen behind and who may require additional assistance. Real teamwork is key here. So I hope that's given you a great understanding of process redesign. Just remember, if you're a process redesigner or a manager, unless you have particular expert knowledge of something, leave the knowledge workers to do what they're good at, but work with them as an organization to improve things. I'd be really grateful if you could consider subscribing. Feel free to like as well, comment below, Look forward to seeing you all next time.